Well, good morning, Meadowbrook. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see all of you. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're so glad that you're with us as well. So I have this plaque in my office. Um, it looks a little something like this. It's got a little poem on it. It's got a mountain on it. Maybe it's hard to see, but it says on the top, don't quit. I got this uh, plaque as a gift from my parents when I was in elementary school. Um, and I, I've kept it all these years. I've had it for over 30 years. It's gone everywhere with me. When I went to college, I brought it to college, grad school to grad school. I keep it in my office now. And I, I got it after a family vacation when I was in elementary school. I grew up in Colorado, and I grew up with two parents who wanted to be outdoors all the time. And so family vacations consisted of doing things outdoors. In the winter, we would go skiing. In the summer, we would go backpacking, and we would go hiking, and we would go camping. And my parents loved it, loved it, loved it. I loved some of it. I didn't love all of it. What they have in Colorado are mountains called 14ers. Anybody know what a 14er is? It is a mountain that has a summit or the top of the mountain at 14,000 feet or higher above sea level. People climb these things for fun. That's what they do. They go climb these mountains for fun. My parents were one of those people who just wouldn't climb these big mountains for fun. They thought it was wonderful. I thought it was terrible. I had no interest in climbing these. I mean, you would get altitude sickness. It's so high, it makes you sick. So high, there's no trees on the top. They're so high that there's snow in the summer on the top of these mountains. And we would do this for fun as a family. And so I was pretty clear with my parents that I did not enjoy this. Like, I would say, my friends are going to Disneyland for vacation. They're going to the beach, and here we're climbing mountains. So we're climbing a mountain called Mount Quandry. I would probably have been somewhere in between fourth and fifth grade at this point, so 10-ish, 11 years old. And there's this moment when you climb 14ers where the trees just stop. That's the tree line. Trees don't grow above the tree line. And we are, at this point, beyond the tree line. We're probably 75% up the mountain, and I'm behind my dad, and I'm just giving him an earful about how this is the worst family vacation ever. I don't know why you would take us up this stupid mountain. You say we're going to get to the top, and there's going to be this beautiful view. I'm sure there are pictures somewhere out there of this beautiful view. We can go get one of those, and we can hang it in our house, and we can have it all the time. All I want to do is go back down. This is a really dumb idea. It's getting cold. It's summer. There's snow. There's not supposed to be snow in the summer on anywhere. This is and I'm just going on and on and on. I'm right on the heels of my dad. He is walking up this mountain, and he stops dead in his tracks. He turns around, and he says, fine, fine, sit down. If you want to quit, just stay here. He took off his backpack. He pulled out my lunch from his backpack. He threw it in my lap, and he said, you can sit here. You can eat your lunch. We'll go to the top, and we'll pick you back up on your way down. Now, if you've ever met my dad, he is the most mild-mannered man I have ever met in my life. This is the one time I can think of in my whole childhood where he lost it on me and blew a fuse, and I was just stunned and shocked. He put his backpack back on his back, and he just walked away. Now, in that moment, all I wanted to do was quit, and he was saying, fine, you can quit. And then comes along my mom. Oh, got to love my mom. Sweet Jama. She comes next to me, and she's like, here, Brian, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take three steps, and then we're going to pause for three seconds. And then we're going to take another three steps, and we're going to pause for three seconds. We're going to take three more steps, pause for three seconds, and that's how we're going to get our way up the mountain and sure enough, we finished. Somewhere along the way, after this vacation was over, we were at like a bookstore or something, and I just saw this plaque on a shelf, and I told my mom, I was like, oh, I should get that. You guys should get that for me, because it has a mountain on it, and when we climbed that mountain, I just wanted to quit. And sure enough, without me knowing, they, they bought it, and then later on gave it to me as a gift. And on the plaque, there's this little poem uh, that goes like this. The, the poem reads, when things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, when you want to smile but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't 
you quit. All I wanted to do that day was quit, but I made it to the top and persevered, no thanks to my dad, but because of the help of my mom. Now, I've kept that plaque with me, and I've taken it with me everywhere that I've gone because there are days that I want to quit. I mean, I love being a pastor. I can't imagine doing anything else with my life. I love being a pastor. It's a privilege to pastor Meadowbrook Church, but there are days when pastoring is hard, and there are days that I want to quit. Like, I love being a dad. I love being a parent. I wouldn't trade my kids for anything, but parenting is hard. And there are days I would love to not have to worry about children at all. There are moments in our life when we hit hard things, and what we want to do is just quit. Anybody identify with that? Maybe it's a job that you hate, and you're like, every day I go to that place, and I just want to walk out the door and never go back. Maybe it's a relationship that you're in that's really difficult. Maybe you're thinking like, oh, my health is suffering, and I just wish I could be out of here and go be with Jesus. I just want to be done. We all face moments in life where we want to quit. And that's true not only in our vocation, not only in relationships. It's also true in our spiritual life, because following Jesus can be difficult. Jesus even says so himself. He, he doesn't cast this illusion that following him is rainbows, butterflies, and lollipops all the time, right? It's hard. It's difficult. He, he says that if you want to be my disciple, you must pick up your cross and follow me, identifying that it is going to get difficult. It is going to get hard. There are going to be this mo these moments where you wonder to yourself, is this worth it? Should I stay the course? And Jesus in John 15 is encouraging his disciples not to quit. He's encouraging his disciples to stay the course. He will use a different word or a different phrase, but basically he is saying to his disciples, don't give up, don't turn back, do not quit. And if you're here this morning and you've found yourself in a place wrestling with whether or not following Jesus is worth it, or whether or not you should give up on it, John 15 is an encouragement to you as well. This is how Jesus begins. This is John 15, verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Now, this is the last of what are called the I am statements in John. There are seven moments throughout John's story where Jesus says, I am, and then on the back end of that two-word phrase, he puts some object, he uses some metaphor to describe who he is. There's seven of them. And if you look at this list, you can see he says, I'm the bread of life, I'm the light of the world, I'm the shepherd, I'm the gate. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the resurrection in the life. And then here we've come to the seventh and final one. I am the vine. Now, when Jesus uses these statements, he's not just pulling random objects. He's not just kind of haphazardly choosing something to identify with or to compare himself to. He's using things in Israel, Israel's history that would be loaded with meaning. They would be historically significant. So when he says in chapter 6, I am the bread of life, there's a conversation going on about Moses providing manna for the Israelites in the desert after they left Egypt. He's referring to a historical moment that has tons of significance for Israel. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he does it at a festival that also remembers the Israelites' wanderings in the wilderness, when God specifically appeared as a pillar of fire. And so Jesus is at this festival where they're lighting these huge oil lamps saying, hey, just like you remember God coming to you as a pillar of fire, I am the light of the world. So he's using things that are historically significant for Israel when he makes these statements. When he says, I am the vine, it's no different the historical significance of vine imagery is that all throughout the Old Testament, the people of God are referred to as a vine. We see it in Psalm 80. Psalm 80, verse 8, it says, You transplanted a vine 
from Egypt, speaking of the Israelites as a vine, when they came out of Egypt, you drove out the nations and planted it, a reference to the promised land. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. You also see it in the prophets, specifically Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. And if you were to jump down to verse 7, just in case you weren't catching the metaphor, Isaiah goes on to say, The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. And the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. It's even thought that in the temple, this is a picture of a replica, there were different places in the temple where there were these gold ornate vines as decoration that served as a symbol. Again, the people of God were referenced as a vine. So vine imagery would have been common to the Israelites, not only because they had vineyards, but also because it was a reference to who they were as God's people. Now, not only does this metaphor have historical significance for Israel, it also has immediate significance for Jesus' disciples. Because the context of this passage is that Jesus is having his final meal with his disciples. He's having his final evening before he will go to the cross and be executed. Within a matter of hours, Jesus will be arrested and tried and strung up on a cross. And he knows that things are going to get difficult for the disciples. He knows that they will be tempted to depart from him. And truthfully, before the evening is over, almost all of the disciples, they do abandon Jesus. They abandon Jesus in his hour of greatest need. It gets really hard. It gets really tough. They think to themselves, if they're arresting him and we're associating with him, what's going to stop them from coming after us? Jesus, good luck to you. We're out. Jesus knows it's going to get really hard for the disciples. They have no idea, but he knows. And so before it gets hard, he's encouraging them to stay the course and not quit. And he's using this vine imagery as a metaphor specifically to remain attached to him as the vine. Notice how many times he uses the word remain in this next section. We're going to keep reading starting in verse 3. He says to the disciples, You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Anybody count how many times? Say that again. Eight. Good. Somebody did a good job. Way to pay attention. Now, Jesus will use that term remain three more times before this passage is over. Eight plus three is how much? Eleven. Right. Good job. Somebody said 14 in the first service. I was like, no, that's not right. That's wrong. (laughs) Eleven times. He uses the word remain 11 times in about 8, 9, 10 verses, which is he's trying to make the point. Stay the course. Don't quit. Don't give up. Remain in me. And Jesus is giving this encouragement, not only to those 12 disciples or the 11 at this point who are still with him, he's also giving that encouragement to us as those who are reading these words 2,000 years removed from when he first said them. And the reason these words are also for us isn't so much because we might find ourselves in a similar position as the disciples did, although we might, but these words are also significant for us because there are many times when we, rather than remaining in Jesus, who is the vine, that we try to be our own vine. See, what Jesus is doing, even though this metaphor would be familiar to the disciples, Jesus is doing something subversive with it. 
Jesus is redefining it. The disciples would hear him say, I am the vine, and they would identify with that. They'd be like, yeah, yeah, we're with you, Jesus. We get it. You're the vine. We're the vine. It's a way that God references Israel. We're the vine. Like Jesus says in verse 1, I am the true vine. And then he says it again in verse 5, I am the vine. See, Jesus is redefining this metaphor, placing himself as the vine. No, no, no. You you are no longer the vine, Jesus is saying to the disciples. That is no longer who you are. He's redefining this metaphor saying, I am the true vine. Verse 5, I am the vine and you, he says to them, are the branches. Jesus is redefining for Israel, for the disciples, and for us, our understanding of ourselves. Because a vine is the source. The vine is the one that provides life. A branch's role within a greater plant is to receive life, is to receive energy from and through the vine. Jesus is redefining this metaphor and there, in turn, redefining the disciples' understanding of themselves. Now, I don't know if the disciples would have reacted this way, but we often react this way, and we may not actually say it in these terms, but we live with this mindset like, I want to be the vine. I want to be in charge. I want to call the shots. I want to be the master of my own destiny. I want to be in control. I believe I am the source of all things. I am the vine. Like the song by Frank Sinatra, I Did It My Way, probably comes to mind, right? I was listening to it just this morning to kind of like soak in this idea of how we as a culture want to be our own vine. And it's a very mild-mannered song to start. But it builds and it has this big crescendo at the end where Frank Sinatra is belting it out at the top of his lungs. I did it. Whose way? My way. I'm the one who's in charge. I call the shots. I, I, I am the vine. Like this is the message we receive from our culture all the time. You're the source. You're the center. It's all about you. You get to define reality as you want. Uh, the clothing company Gap did a series of print ads a handful of years ago that captured this perfectly. They, they were simple ads with just an individual wearing Gap clothing um, who were, you know, in black and white, these black and white grainy photos. And the tagline for this campaign was just simply, you know, something blank, your own blank. Meaning, like, you can't see it. It's hard for you to see it. But it was just invent your own story. So it's this idea like, hey, your story is yours to write. You're the center of your story, so go write your own story. You have another image that looked like this. It was uh, right here on the left. It says, make up your own philosophy. Hey, you're the vine. You're the source. However you want your life to go, just make up your own life philosophy. The next one was perfect your own look. And then the last one we have here is it says name your own destiny. Putting the individual at the center, having everything else revolve around them. Now, this ad campaign is probably 15 years old, but it still is wildly relevant today because this is the world we live in. And what Gap is doing here is they're not actually selling clothes Rather, they're selling a worldview, and their hope is that they will hook you in with that worldview to say, like, yeah, that's true. I get to write my own story. I get to name my own destiny. I get to make up my own philosophy, and putting on a gap jacket will help me do that, right? Like, they're selling a worldview, hoping that you resonate with that worldview, and that they will help you bring that worldview into existence. We live with the mentality all the time that we are the vine. And and this, this temptation to be our own source, this temptation to be our own vine, has been the temptation of humanity since the beginning. You go back to Genesis chapter 3, 1, 2, and 3. God creates this good world. 
He creates Adam and Eve. He puts them in this good world that he has created to partner with him in stewarding and caring for his creation. And he says, you can eat of any tree in the garden except for one. He says, there's this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of that tree, you will die. One day, Adam and Eve are hanging out by this tree, and the serpent comes along and starts to whisper in their ear, did God really say, do you think he's serious in that? My guess is he's holding out on you because he knows there's something better out there, and if you take hold of this fruit, your eyes will be open, your mind will be enlightened, and you will then have the life that you want. What God is trying to do is control you, push you down, and keep his thumb on you so that you would live a subpar life. So Adam and Eve succumb to the, de- the deception. They succumb to the temptation. They eat the fruit, and instantly their eyes are open. Instantly sin enters our world. Shame fills them from head to toe. And from that point on, all relationships everywhere are broken and fractured. The relationship we have with God, the relationship we have with one another, and the relationship we have with ourselves. And what comes into the world at this point is the bad fruit that sin, that sin brings, which is fear, because Adam and Eve go into hiding. They start to blame each other. They get defensive and shames all over the place, and they enter into self-preservation mode. See, the question that John 15 is asking is, what is your life producing? What is your life producing? We would hope that the answer would be the fruit of the Spirit. Like John's, uh, that, that Paul says in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But if you were to ask the people who are closest to you, what would they say that your life is producing? What would they say is the outcome and the result of your life? See, when Adam and Eve try to be their own vine, when they try to be their own source, their life produces fear, defensiveness, shame, and blaming. And John 15 stands as an invitation to live a different life. Within the metaphor of John 15, this is what's called fruit. If, if Jesus repeatedly uses the word remain to capture the posture with which the disciples should have with him, his hope is that their life would then bear a certain type of fruit. He uses the term bear fruit almost as much as he does remain in this passage. The correlation being remain in him and your life will take a very different result. The question is, what is your life producing? And are you satisfied with what it's producing? Or is it hurting the people around you and you're living a very dysfunctional life because you're trying to be your own vine? Now, the first half of this passage is more metaphorical, right? He's using this imagery of vine and branches and fruit. But as you move into the second half of this passage, Jesus starts to get a whole lot more literal. He says this in verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now, remain specifically, not just remain in me vaguely, or not just remain in me as a branch remains to a vine. He says, remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Jesus is saying that there are three things that will result in your life by remaining in him. There are three outcomes. There are three specific fruits that you will see in your life if you remain in him. And the first is love. He says, remain in me. Remain in my love so that my love will remain in you. And love is the point of this whole section. The section begins in chapter 13. Chapter 13 through 17 is this section of John's gospel. It is the section where Jesus is having his final night with his disciples. John is a circular writer, meaning he keeps circling around certain ideas to try and get his point 
a cross. Throughout his entire gospel, he circles around the idea of eternal life repeatedly. Maybe 70, 80 times he uses this term eternal life. He's circling around the idea of believe. The way you access this eternal life isn't through trying hard and being a good person, but it's believing in Jesus. He's circling those two ideas continually throughout his story. He'll also circle around the idea that Jesus is the light in the darkness. He says that in chapter 1, the light shines in the darkness. He's circling these ideas all the time. In chapter 13 through 17, specifically 13, 14, and 15, he's circling the idea of love over and over and over. This is probably like my sixth, seventh week preaching through 13, 14, and 15. I'm like, I just keep seeing this idea of love over and over and over. He's trying really hard to help us see this is the point. If Jesus could choose just one trait to instill in all of his disciples, it would be the trait of love. John is hammering it home. He says in chapter 13, verse 34, a new command I give to you, love one another. He says the very similar thing here in chapter 15. He says in verse 12, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. And then he says it again in chapter, verse 17 rather. This is the very last verse of this passage. Verse 17, this is my command, love each other. Now the way that Jesus defines love isn't through feeling a certain way about somebody. It isn't through some sort of romantic experience. It isn't just being nice and kind or complimentary to people or giving them the ability to do whatever they want. Jesus defines love in a very specific way. He says, love each other as I have loved you. And then he says this in verse 13, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Sacrificial love is the greatest expression of love there is. In Antarctica, there are these penguins known as emperor penguins. Anybody ever heard of emperor penguins before? They're known to be the biggest, largest, strongest. They can swim the fastest. They can dive the deepest penguins. Emperor penguins because they're so big. There is um, a documentary out there called The March of the Penguins narrated by um, Morgan Freeman that describes in details the reproductive journey of these emperor penguins and what they do in bringing life into the world. Somewhere along the the months of April and May, they leave the ocean and they start to migrate towards the middle of Antarctica to a breeding ground where once they arrive there, they will choose a mate. They will find a mate, they'll find a partner, and the hope is that they will mate and then they will eventually produce an egg, one egg, the female emperor penguins, produce one egg a year. And after this egg is um, delivered, there's this very delicate transfer that happens from the mother who laid the egg to the father. And it has to happen quick because if this egg gets away from the two of them or if this egg stays on the ice floor too long, it will freeze and the baby chicken side will die. So there's this really quick yet delicate transfer where the father will put his little feet together. The mother will kind of shoo the egg up onto the father's feet. And then he's got this like pouch underneath his skin that he folds over the egg, keeping his feet together the whole time to incubate this egg and keep it warm. The mother, because she has just gone through the process of labor, leaves the father behind, goes back to the ocean, essentially to feed and regain her strength. And the father stays in that spot for two months, eats nothing, endures the darkest days of winter, the coldest temperatures, and eventually huddles up with all of the other father penguins in this one spot just to try and stay warm and keep this egg warm so that this chick has a chance of survival. For two months, 60 days, They live in the harshest conditions on the planet, just hoping that this baby chick will make it. Like, what a picture of sacrificial love. I don't even know if I'd do that for my own kids, right? (laughs) I'd be like, I'll come back in two months. Hope you make it, kid. Just kidding. I love my kids. 
But that's what love is. Love is sacrifice. Love is making yourself uncomfortable. Love is laying down your life. Love is going to extreme measures to bring life to somebody else at the expense of yourself. It's cheap to say I love you, but to never have a sacrificial act accompany those words, those words become hollow words. Jesus is saying, if you want to love like that, the way you will get the power is only through me. He's saying, remain in me. Stay attached to me. Trust that my spirit is in you. My life is flowing through you. And if and only if you do that, do you have the capacity and the ability to love other people. If we remain in Jesus, the fruit that comes out of our life is love. We will be tempted to depart to become our own vine. The love we have will be hollow and cheap. We can only produce sacrificial love by remaining continually connected to Jesus. The other fruit that comes, the other result that comes in that process is joy. Jesus says this in verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that Jesus wants our joy to be exponential in our lives. Sometimes we think that God's desire is for us to be like grumpy and curmudgeon and stuffy, and that's what it means to be serious religious people. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Like, my joy should be in you. Your joy should be complete because my joy is complete in you. When you remain attached to Jesus and you live sacrificially, it actually brings joy, which sometimes we never connect. One of the things that's happening in our lives right now, we're in this stage of life where all we do on the weekends is cart our kids to different sporting events. Anybody else either there now or been there before? Yeah, like, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, we've got like three soccer games and like six volleyball games, and that's our weekend. We wake up at eight on Saturday morning, ping pong to soccer games in the morning, ping pong to volleyball games in the afternoon, and then probably have another afternoon soccer game somewhere along the way Sunday afternoon. Now, as parents, you sacrifice yourself for your kids in that way, because you want your kids to have these experiences. You want them to learn things through that activity. You want them to be able to like make friends along the way. And one of the things my wife has continually done for the last five years is coach our daughter's volleyball team. We come to the, the end of every fall season, and she says, I never want to do that again. I never, I mean, the kids don't listen to me at practice. They don't really care about the sport. They just want to be on their phones and play, you know, do each other's nails the whole time. It's maddening. I love volleyball and I want them to get it, but they could care less. But then you have these moments. It's around now, this time of the year, where it's like, man, they can actually start to play. And you actually see the, like, the development of their skills. And like they can hit the ball multiple times back and forth across the net. And you can see they make a hit and they make a shot. And you're like, wow. And they get excited about it. And you're like, Wow. There's actually something that's paying off with what we're doing. And there's this joy that comes through the sacrifice of giving your weeknights and your weekends and hanging with young women who don't want to do this, but yet actually come to this place where they're like, wow, they can actually play. So she always says, hey, if I get to the point next year where I say I'm coaching volleyball, don't let me do it. <laughs> and then sure enough, August rolls around. I'm like, hey, what are you doing? She's like, I'm going to sign up to coach volleyball for the girls, right? Because there's something about the joy that we experience when we see the sacrifice and the dedication towards something actually bring a result in somebody else's life that's wonderful and magnificent. And we experience joy through giving of ourselves repeatedly and continually. That's what Jesus is talking about with his sacrifice. It says in Hebrews that Jesus in for the joy set before him, it says in Hebrews 12, Jesus endured the cross. There was joy for Jesus in sacrificing his death because he knew the result would be the souls of many being saved and redeemed. And Jesus says here, it's not just joy that we receive, but it's also friendship. If he's redefining this metaphor for the Israelites, for them to understand who they are, that they are the branch is not the, font, the vine. Jesus is also redefining the relationship that he has with them. Verse 14, you are my friends 
if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. Sometimes to think of the idea of like being friends with God might seem kind of uncomfortable because he's high and holy and we are not. But the reality with a friend is somebody who knows you really well, they know all your stuff. They know all your junk. They know the highs, the lows, the good and the bad. They know it all. But yet they're still continually present with you. Saying, I'm I'm not going anywhere. Because my relationship, my love is not dependent on your performance or your good behavior, but I'm here to be with you because, because I love you. And that's what Jesus is saying with the disciples. Like, I know it all. I know what's coming. I know that you're going to abandon me. I know that you're not always going to get it right. But I'm giving my life for you, not just for your joy, but for my joy as well. So come enter into this relationship of this continual cycle of sacrificial love and joy and friendship that we can share. What Jesus is trying to capture for his disciples is that fruit, the fruit of joy, the fruit of love comes from friendship with Jesus. And so the question is, Yeah, why would you want to stay the course? Why would you want to remain? I mean, as I get older, I realize the need for friends in my life. Kate, we were joking in the kitchen. She's like, Dad, you don't have any friends. And don't say that person. And don't say that person. You work with them. They're not your friends. And I was like, ah. But as we get older, I mean, it's like, it's all your world is when you're younger. It's friends, friends, friends. As you get older, you have this need for friends. And Jesus is saying, I'm the best friend you're ever going to have. I'm not going anywhere. I love you desperately. There's so much joy to be had in our relationship. And even when it seems like everybody else is leaving you, I'm not going anywhere. So why stay the course? It's to have a friendship relationship with Jesus. So how is your relationship with Jesus? Are you receiving and experiencing the joy that he has for you in that? Or are you just using him? so that you can have some results in the afterlife and get to heaven when you die. But do you realize in the here and now, you have access to eternal life, eternal love. Because the reality in being your own vine is that you might be able to experience love, you might be able to experience joy, but when you're your own vine, they don't necessarily last. That joy isn't always forever. That love isn't always continual. But with Jesus, when you're attached to him, It is. And he says, verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. My command is this. Love one another. As we rest and remain in Jesus, we receive the friendship that he offers. We experience the joy that he has, and we then have the capacity for his love to flow to us and through us. And at the center of it is friendship with him. So if you're here this morning and you're tempted to quit, if you're tempted to depart, if you're tempted not to stay the course, take these words of Jesus and and put them deep in your soul. That the life that he offers is way better than anything you'll find elsewhere. In him are the words to eternal life, everlasting love, and continual joy, and a friendship with the God of the universe who knows you intimately and still loves you the same. So may you see that Jesus is the true vine and we are the branches. May you remain in his life and in his love and enjoy being his friend so that his love would flow to you and through you to the world around you. Lord, we thank you so much for the words of John 15. We thank you so much for the richness of it all. Lord, we ask that you would give us eyes to see, that we would come to understand the significance of being friends with you, that we would not pursue you out of obligation or duty or because we think we can get something from you, but we can pursue you just because of who you are. So, Lord, we ask 
that we would remain. I pray for anybody here this morning who is tempted to depart, to give up and quit. And I pray that they would stay the course with you, trusting that you're better than anything they will ever find. Amen.